All right, go ahead. Um, so I don't know, like I tried to style the root um using the um like changing the um backgrounds, but I don't know like roots. So uh, should I change it to um I mean, do I to change it here? How do I change? How do I put? How do how do I put um? How do I put the? How to put it on the JavaScript? The, I mean the app, the root, and then um, do I have to put a like a what do you call that? A class name something equal something something like that. Yeah. So when you use the hashtag, uh, that indicates that you're searching for an element that has the ID that matches. So hashtag root selects an HTML element that has an mm -hmm. ID of root, which I think is actually in your index.jx. Oh my God, that was not English. Index.jsx, or I think you've renamed it to main.jsx. Um, yeah, so this is where it creates an element, uh, document.get element by ID root. And so this will apply to the root element um, um which so uh, it's just basic html i think uh there might be a more specific question but let me really quick just address your module versus regular css question and then maybe that will be a little bit more clear and then is it module you put in react but then like in so like a module a is a, a way of writing CSS such that it only applies to a specific React component. So normally, if I write CSS in my app.css file, so not app.module.css, app.css, and then I import that CSS file to any React component, it is now available for every single component that renders on my site, which might not be what you want. You might want um, only that a certain style applies to that component because you have another component somewhere else that has the same ID or the same class. And so you're going to have to get really creative with your class and ID names because you're going to have such an enormous site and you can't possibly duplicate any classes or IDs since your CSS applies globally. It'll apply to every single component. And so your modules are a way of saying, I want this CSS to only apply to my app component and then any subcomponents can import their own modules and have the styling only apply to that component. So that's the reason why modules exist. It's like a, a React specific thing. Um, so if you have any styles that go onto an element that is rendered in your app.jsx, do you jump in there for a second on your right pane? Yeah. So you... Where do you want me to go? Open the app.jsx, please. This is this is yeah. And then let's scroll down to the bottom so we can see what you're actually returning here. Okay, cool. So if you wanted to apply a styling to maybe like that H1 to do list, but not have it apply to an H1 in every single component, then you could put your styles and select H1 inside of app.module.css. Um it's, it's a little bit limiting in that uh, if you do like want everywhere on your site for every instance of an H1 to look the same, or maybe you want to apply like a certain font everywhere on your site, then modules aren't really like a great way to do that, I don't think, um, although it's probably doable still. But I think that's the reason why they exist. So in general, if you have something you're trying to style, you would put that styling inside the module the CSS module that goes into your component where that thing lives. And then it gets converted into um, JavaScript classes that you can then attach to your actual component itself. I'm still lost. Uh, like, so if at the root, I want, uh, I want the sizing for all pages. Shouldn't that, um, shouldn't I put it in a, uh... In there, I mean, in in the uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I should put in class, right? Class name should. 
So if you're selecting an ID or a class, it's going to look specifically for that. So this selector is going to apply padding and max width and margin to yeah. root element, which uh -uh. Uh, I think is an ID. But um, <laughs> so if you want to do it everywhere, I'm I'm not 100% sure on this. Um, I know there was a question last week because there was some concept of like a global selector inside of a module, um, which I did not like fully understand and couldn't really help with a whole lot. Um, so. so you might want to do like a global rule if you're trying to get it to apply everywhere. Um, because this is like, I think this is, um. Uh, this is like the sizing of the page, right? Padding auto, like maximum width. Like yeah, so this is. So should, so I should have it on all pages if I have page, more than one page here. Depends shouldn't that, on like, layout. Shouldn't that be global? Well, I think. Yeah, your, your root is your outermost element. And so the padding, I think. Um, the padding and the margin should work on all of your pages because everything's inside that root element. The max width, I'm not 100% sure how it's going to work, but I think that would also be fine in theory. The thing is, I'm very confused. So if I change something in module, I have to change something like an app. I just change something like I had to set a class name equal something, something like that. Uh, a colon as a class name. Is it equal or something, you know, and then like curly brackets and something like that, curly bracket. So I have to change it like that. It's so I just all these I need to add into the um the JSX. Um because I have anything I anything I put on the module, I have to change it here to even uh, import it is still uh, to have uh, like a class name and then yes equal something something uh, like what I'm trying to say is um um uh, it's hard for me to explain um especially the recording and I'm like don't yeah wanna I sound think I'm up. also just not telling you the right things uh, um. So, I'm like I'm generally right not here. super familiar with modules myself, which is why I'm like having a difficult time answering this. But um, I, think, I think you're correct, and I'm uh, here is what is confusing me here. Um, like this is the module, and then I had to do it. Um, oh shoot. Okay. Uh, did I just hear? Okay. So like, I have a. Uh, to do list container and I have to use a to do list container. Ah. Um, okay. It? Um, but here I had to do something like that. I, I yeah. Each, each one I do something that is kind of, it's kind of annoying, you know, because I had to it do like style and then to do something like that. I and totally then, agree with you. This is the here, downside I of I have to do that. I mean, right here at, uh, for the L, uh, for this, for the, uh, the font, I have to do like that, which is, each time any chunk of code I put in the CSS module, I have to have a class name equal something, some style. Yes, which that is, is true. Um, That's just what CSS modules are. It's a way yeah, for CSS is same, individual but I, thing. If you don't like that, then you don't have to use CSS modules. If you want to style all of your H1 elements or all of your buttons or your divs, or just use like normal CSS where I can select from an ID or a class, you are so welcome to do that. Like you do not have to only use modules and then stick in in every single component. If you want to share a class between multiple things, maybe a module isn't a good solution in that case. In that case, just create a normal like uh, button styles.css and then import it from your to-do list item. And then That's you right. can just apply the class or the ID as the selector that your button has. Okay, so I don't really have to exactly have to do a module, right? It's no, a module is just one way of handling CSS. If it fits your purpose, great. Mm -hmm. It's it's I helpful. This lesson. Thing, but 
if you are finding it cumbersome to put one of your classes on every single element, then maybe you don't need to do it. But uh, uh, I thought this lesson had to be a use module, no? Probably for this lesson, they want you to do it. Um, but maybe like in your future outside of this particular assignment, mm -hmm. you can do whatever you think makes the most sense at the time. I personally like don't really use CSS modules um, okay. right. because Thank all you. it's really doing is sort of taking something that you can do in vanilla React and then putting it somewhere else. It's so, like you can you can give any HTML element in React a styles tag and then give it a JavaScript object that just has all these same properties in it already. You don't get as many of the benefits of writing in a CSS file um, as you would just like writing inside the component, but then you don't have to like go somewhere else to look at the styles for this particular component. And so I think the visibility is a little better, but like that's essentially what it's doing here. It's taking CSS styles, putting it into an object, and then you give that object to the HTML element. So you can do that if you want to, but I usually prefer to just create the object directly on the HTML element rather than uh, in a separate CSS file and using modules and whatnot. So it's just an option for this assignment. I think they want you to use modules, so I would do it, but uh, in your future, you don't have to if you don't want to. Oh, okay, thank you. Good questions. Sorry it took so long to understand the problem. Yeah, I didn't know how to explain it either. That's okay. Any other questions or just generally anything you want to review? Like this is a review week. We have 40 minutes. I'm happy to just go back and talk about anything that's not super clear or something you're working on that you're stuck on. If there's nothing in particular, then we can talk about something else, but it is a review week. Okay. There is anything that comes up that you guys are curious about. Uh, feel free to leave it in the chat at any time. Otherwise, um, ooh, opponent styling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll show you what I'm doing. That's a good point. I should show what I was talking about rather than just telling. Yeah, so uh, okay, so what we were doing just now is we were creating um, and do form dot module dot CSS and then saying some class is equal to text, all right, let's do background, color of yellow. And then I would import um, Import styled. Hmm. It's not auto completing. I expected it to. Anyway. So we would uh, take the styles and then I would say, ooh, I want my input to have a background of yellow. So I'll give it a class name property. And the class name can be styles. Dot uh my component or whatever we call it some class so 
the reason why I don't like this is because if I look at this, I just see, oh, it has this particular class. But like, unless I pull up the CSS module, I have absolutely no idea what's actually in here. Behind the scenes, it's taking the CSS when we compile our code and then it's turning into a JavaScript object um, that will then sort of insert the styles directly into this um, HTML element. But React lets you create a style property, which you can pass it a JavaScript object and you can just set these properties directly. So I'll set the background color to be yellow and text size, font size to be 12 and so on and so forth. So the syntax is a little bit different here and you don't get quite as many benefits as writing in a CSS file. Like I can't see the color. Um, I think I have an extension that puts the color for you automatically and you can select it. Um, and there's some other things that come from this as well that you don't really get if you're just creating a JavaScript object. But if I'm trying to apply style specifically to this component and nothing else, then I think this is preferable because when I'm looking at that component, I can see all the unique styles directly on that component. I don't have to go somewhere else for it. And then I can also give it a class name uh, and an ID and whatever. And then I can write other CSS that will also do the same thing and give it additional styles. Um, but if you're applying specifically to a component, I personally prefer writing them in line like this. And then if you have something that needs to apply to a lot of different components, that's when I would just create a general style sheet, like maybe button styles.css and some but class font size 24 pixels, background color green. And this I want to apply to a bunch of different buttons. This one you don't have you don't put in a module um button style module because you're you want to apply to a bunch of uh, buttons is that why yeah. not exactly to one component but to a bunch of them right yeah I want this to be something that applies to my whole site anywhere that I see a button with this particular class it should just automatically pick up the styling and that way I don't have to like specifically insert it in here like we did um with the CSS module, like into each individual button, I can just say, well, this is a sum button class, but, and then when I run this code, it'll automatically pick that up. So I will generally default to like anything that needs to go in a lot of different places in a CSS file. Um, and then anything that's like component specific, I'll just put it in style tag. Or you can just put everything in a CSS file. That's also fine. You just have to be really creative about your um, about your names. Because if I create a, a class here, and then I have something that I named the class where I'm expecting the style to get applied, and then accidentally somewhere else in my page, I give that class to another item, or I try and reuse that class, then you're going to have collisions and weird stuff happening. Thank you. Personally, how I do it, uh, whatever makes sense for your use case. All right, any other questions? All right, so with that, I will transition on to a backup topic, just something else that might be interesting to you guys. And that is the concept of regular expressions. Uh, I'm just gonna repost this in the chat while I'm thinking about it. If you didn't get a chance to sign in earlier, um, make sure you do so before you leave. Okay. 
I am going to create a new project really quick to make directory new expressions. We'll open it in VS Code. And I'm going to npm init to create a new npm project. All these defaults are fine. Sure, go for it. And we're going to npm install a couple different things. I'm going to do some TypeScript today. Uh, since we talked about it last week, um, it's for the extra benefits. And then we're going to create index.ts. And we're going to write a start script. A nodimon, which just constantly tries to run our code. And every time it changes, it'll rerun it. So I have to constantly start and stop it over and over. Uh, see if this works. Sweet. All right, so it just constantly runs my code and then every time I change something, it'll rerun it. So this is just like something you can do with vanilla node. You can run, use Nodemon um, with React. You don't have to do this because Vite does this for you automatically. But it's the same kind of thing as hot reload. Okay, so regular expressions are a way of matching a specific pattern to any given string or attempting to match it and determining whether or not that pattern fits the string that you give it. So why would I be interested in doing this? Sometimes you just need to validate that a piece of text follows the expected pattern and it's way more concise and intelligible to do it with a regular expression than to write a bunch of really complicated code that can check the same things. So, one really common example would be if you're trying to validate maybe a password fits a bunch of arbitrary restrictions that you give your user or an email. Let's do a password. Um, actually, let's not do that. Let's do an email. So we're going to say that on our website, an email follows following definition. Um, it needs to have exactly one at sign and it needs to end in dot com or dot org or so on and so forth. So it needs to have something at the beginning, it needs to have something at the end that ends in a dot and then maybe three letters here. And let's think of some other restrictions that our emails need to have. Maybe our email cannot have an empty prefix or suffix, meaning this is not a valid email. So we can't have nothing before the at sign or after. Um, yeah, let's go with this. I think this is okay for now. So generally, these are things that we understand about an email, but an email is just a piece of text. So I could um, create an array valid emails. and create a couple of different valid emails in here. This is a valid email, this is my email. Um, dumb, dumb user, I'm gonna stop this for a second since we're not doing anything important. 
فقعدت code.dream.org something like that um, this is a valid email and so on and so forth and in comparison we have some invalid emails which would be at Smith. This is not valid because it has multiple at signs. And uh, it needs to end in something.com or org. So maybe Eli. Elijah at Smith is not valid because it needs to end in a dot and then three letters. And similarly, Elijah at code the dream dot. Organization is not valid because it needs to be three letters at the end. And uh, this is not a valid email, and this is not a valid email. So you have a couple of examples at this point. This generally hits all of our cases for what is allowed and what isn't. And you're creating on your front end, on your React project, you are creating validation that this is a valid email that I can put in my database and say, yes, this is okay. Now you could write the code that tries to enforce all of these. It would be really long. You would write a function that would first scan through everything and look for one at sign. And then if you don't find that at sign, you fail. Or if you find too many, then you fail. And then you could get all the text that's after the at sign and check that it matches this general pattern where I can go an arbitrary number of characters and then I have a dot and three letters and if there's more, then you fail it and so on and so forth. The amount of restrictions here is just going to grow. Um, there's way more definitions of what's a valid email than just what we've put down here. I think these are like the most important things, but I'm sure there's other things that you can't put in the email or things that you wouldn't want people to be able to put in an email because maybe it is a problem. There's something called SQL injection where uh, you like give a string to a server that's like an SQL string, uh, which is a language that just selects information from your database and you're trying to exploit a system such that your SQL accidentally gets executed. Uh, and then you can like get a bunch of data from the database and do some crazy stuff. It's hard to do, uh, and it's very bad if someone allows you to do it on their website. But in general, we wouldn't want to allow anything like that to get through our email filter because it should never get to the point where it's being put into our database. So there might be lots of other things you need to check here. Well, instead of writing code to do this, we could do this in basically one line with a regular expression. A regular expression is just a definition of a pattern that follows any format that you want to enforce on your strings. So maybe I want to check just basically that hello appears in my string somewhere. This is a regular expression. And I can go ahead and test my regular expression on a particular string and then run this code. Oops, I forgot to console.log so we can actually see the results. And so I can test this pattern to see if it fits inside of any arbitrary string. Hello does appear in the string, hello world. And so that is true. And hello does not appear inside of not a match. And so it's false. So you can use this to pretty easily validate whether uh, your string is actually following the right format. Um, and we can do this all in one regular expression, or we could create a regular expression for each of these tests 
And that way we can more easily determine which one is failing. Um, whereas if we put them all into one regular expression, it's gonna be really complicated. And we also won't really have any indication of which rule it's failing as part of that expression. Uh, so maybe it would be better to create three different expressions. And I think we'll probably do that as we're going through just for clarity. So this is what we do. We'll create a pattern and then we'll use that pattern to try and match up against these valid emails and not against the invalid ones. For the sake of demonstration, I'm going to pull up a site that I use anytime that I need to create a regular expression, which is regexer. I'm going to copy in my regular expressions here into this text section. Well, cool. so I just have a bunch of text here and as I write my regular expression up here in the top, it's going to attempt to execute it against every line of text and identify where there's a match. And if there is a match, then it'll highlight the match. And if there isn't one, it will not highlight it, which indicates that our test would fail. So right now, this is a regular expression that it puts in there by default, uh, and it does not match against any of these lines. And so if I ran in my JavaScript, this regular expression dot test on all of these, then it's going to fail. So in JavaScript, we define a regular expression as uh, a sequence of characters in between two forward slashes. You can also define it as a new regular expression and then create a string and put it in here. This is exactly the same. Um, this one has a little bit of better highlighting to it than a string by itself, but they are functionally exactly the same. And the characters that you put inside the pattern here are super important to identify what you want your regular expression to try and do. So this is the cheat sheet on this website here, cheat sheet. And this is just all of the different kinds of patterns that we can give to try and match up against something. So if I put just an at sign, it's gonna tell me that this pattern matches an at character, which you can see in here, it highlights on all of these. And so every single line would pass that it does in fact match this pattern since the pattern occurs somewhere in this. Generally, we can do some really cool stuff. Um, we can create a pattern that's just a bunch of characters. So I want to match specifically this set of characters. Then I can do that. I do have to use a backslash for the period because uh, it's a special character. So the backslash means that it met, it's like using it as a literal, it's trying to match a period character. And so this will match up here. We can do some more complicated things though. We can say match Elijah, any character with just a period by itself. So this will match up here where it's separated by periods, but also down here where it's separated by an ad sign because a period is a wildcard character. It can match anything, but exactly one anything. Other things we can do, we could say match any word character, um, which means that any uh, like alphabetic character that's together in a word is going to get matched. These are individual matches or I can match one of any number of characters. So uh, 
let's say I want to match only the vowels. We'll count Y as a vowel for this purpose. These square brackets mean any of the characters inside of here is a match. Um, and so this is valid uh, and any match is a vowel somewhere in the string. Or we can do more complicated things like say, let's match um, two T's in a row. So this only matches if I have a T and then another T right afterwards. Um, it does not match only one T. So I have a T over here in Smith, but because it only occurs one time, it's not a match. I could do other things like match uh, one or more T characters. And so now anywhere that I see a T is gonna be a match. Or I can say match zero or more of the preceding token. Um, so it matches against T, but this one doesn't actually have any effect because it's still looking for only T characters. It says that it's looking for zero or more, but it doesn't match against anything that's not a T. So functionally, it's the exact same as saying one or more. And I can match literally everything by saying dot and then uh, give me groups of exactly three characters. So this would match any string that has at least three characters in it. This one has less than three down here. So you can like get creative and match literally any pattern that you want to try and match. And so we're gonna do that. Let's uh, take our rules and we'll put them on the side over here and try to create a regular expression that will allow us to match all of these rules. This is not actually gonna work. This is too big. Cool. I'm gonna keep my cheat sheet open. So let's create a regular expression that checks that there is exactly one at sign. So I know that I'll probably need an at sign but there can't be multiple, it has to be exactly one. So I could do this by saying I need exactly one at sign, but this still isn't quite perfect because it just checks that there's an at sign somewhere in the string and exactly one in a row. If I were to put two, it would match them individually which is also not what we want. So this doesn't quite work like we might expect it to. So if we want to match the entire string, if I just put something in here, it's going to look for it anywhere in the string. Um, but we want to say the whole string is some number of characters and then an at sign and then some other number of characters and nothing else. So we're gonna have to get a little creative here. We can use these anchor characters, which say this pattern has to be at the start and at the end of the word. If I use them together, it means that it has to match the entire string, or I can just use one or the other. I could say only match the start of my string where it starts with Elijah. And then if I have another line over here, that has Elijah not at the beginning, then it's not going to match. Uh, actually, I think this is considered one gigantic string here, which is why it's not matching these ones down here. But generally, this means Elijah has to show up at the beginning. And then this would mean Elijah has to show up at the end, which is not the case. But down here, if I add it to the end of this long string, then it is. And I could say that the whole string has to be Elijah and nothing else. And then it would match, start and the end. But we don't want that. So we know that we want our whole string to be something, an at sign, and then something else. But this is one character. 
So I could say um, it needs to be, let's combine this with our rule down here where we can't have empty before or after for this at sign. And let's say it needs to occur one or more times this any character. So this matches, if I were to give it an empty terminator, then it doesn't match because there's nothing after this at sign. There has to be at least one character of any kind. And then over here, this also doesn't work because there's nothing before the at sign and there has to be exactly one, at least one thing. And there we go. So that checks that our email is not empty on either side. So this is one regular expression. Let's uh, throw this in here. Uh, let not empty fix. We'll just call this not empty regex. And this regular expression will be this. And this indicates that we have an at sign and then something before and something after. We can also make this a little bit better because these characters can't really be anything. Like we don't want someone to be able to create an email that has a bunch of special characters in it. And it definitely can't have another at sign in it because that would be a problem. So this is not a valid email. And our regular expression is still saying, yeah, that's okay. So we need to restrict what this any character is. So let's say that it can be any character except it can't be all of our special characters, um, which I could try and type all of them out, but I don't think that's going to be very helpful. But it can be um, any alphanumeric or underscore character. That's totally fine. And then we want to have one or more of those. And then we want to have another alphanumeric character and then one or more of those. Hmm. This does not seem to work. Why doesn't this work? Word character. Oh, it's because these periods. So let's say this character can be a word or it can be a period. So this is alphanumeric or an underscore, and then this is a period character. And I think that's it. That's all we're going to allow. And then we'll copy this on your side. And now it matches our whole string. So our string is any character from inside of these uh, curly brace or square braces, any character in this set can be either an alphanumeric or underscore character, or it can be a period. And then the same thing afterwards. And it has to be one or more of them. So it can't be empty. So this is not valid. This is not valid, so on and so forth. If I were interested in testing it against a bunch of different strings, then I could add tests in here to make sure my expression worked and then run it against all those tests. Um, but I'm pretty confident, and so I'm just going to directly copy it in here. So this is our first regex. Um, and then we want a regex that checks that it ends in something.org or .com or .eu or some three alphabetic characters here. So let's create that. So we're going to say the ending 
of our string has to be at some valid characters like we had in our previous regex, any character that's allowed. And then we need to have a dot and then any other characters and exactly three of them. Okay, so this is really complicated what I just typed in here. This is a range, which means any character that occurs within this range, which you'll typically use for letters uh, where it goes A, B, C, so on and so forth. So this is any lowercase letter or any uppercase letter and exactly three of them. So if I'm reading this, this is uh, anything and we don't care really how much. So we're going to say one or more. So there's something and then an at sign and then something else and it needs to end with dot three letters. So this is not valid. Dot com, that should be valid, but it's not working. We'll make this simpler. So this ends in dot com, dot org works, dot edu works, uh, dot ABC works, dot CBS works, anything like that. So this checks that our email successfully ends. And so we're going to take this regex and we're also going to use it in our JavaScript. Ending regex. And now we have two patterns. This is very difficult to understand when you first look at it. So this is why people generally like leave regex for when you really need it because it gets kind of ugly. But in general, it solves a very specific problem and it is a useful tool to have, but don't go overboard. Like let's not write a regex that's like 40 bajillion characters long and has all kinds of craziness to it because no one's gonna have any idea what this means. So I'm keeping mine short and for a specific purpose, which I describe with the name of my variable. If I'm really worried, I can put a comment on here, checks that this email has one at sign and is not empty before or after, and just add some commentary. Checks that this ends in dot xxx. And now I can run these tests against all of my emails. Or let's get emails of emails and I expect that when I get the results of dot empty regex dot test email in conjunction with ending regex dot test that this should print true. And I also expect that for my invalid ones, it should print false for all. Oops, not quite. So these are saying they're not valid. Oops, this one isn't valid because it's not .edu or .org or anything like that. And this one is failing because I have a hyphen, which I don't allow. If I change this to an underscore, 
and change it like this, then I think this will work. Yeah, so now these are all valid emails and these are all invalid emails. A at B at C we said was invalid and hyphen email. This is also invalid because that's a hyphen and hyphen. Cool. So we have a regular expression that in one line of code, we can test that this email is completely valid. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, one thing that we learned in one of my classes uh, in college is sort of like the like underlying representation of how you can sort of understand a regular expression um, where it's sort of like a graph, which is a collection of different objects that link to each other. And then you can move from object to object, call them nodes typically. Um, and you represent it as something called a state machine where it represents as you're going through and changing between different states. Uh, it, it sort of represents checking each part of a string uh, as, I don't even know how to describe it the best way. If you're interested, I definitely look at state machines. I think they're like a cool thought experiment, not something that you'll actually write and code yourself. Um, but an interesting computer science read, if nothing else. And you can sort of represent regular expressions as a state machine where you go from state to state depending on the next character. And if it fits a specific pattern, then you move to the next state represented by that pattern. I'm not doing it justice, um, but I think it's a cool. Read. Okay. I've talked to you guys for about 40 minutes now about regular expressions. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Um, otherwise, have a great weekend. I'll see you guys next week with something completely different. Happy Thursday. Thank you. Bye.